Okay, good morning. Let's, let's get started with a prayer. Father, this is your day, and we shall praise you. This is your day, and we shall declare your name. This is your day, and we shall worship a risen Savior and our King. All honor and glory are yours, and we thank you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The, uh, the title of this sermon is We of Little Faith. And there's an old Irish parable of an older priest and a younger priest going to speak to one of the congregation that had done a terrible thing, committed a, a terrible sin. And the older one said to the younger, um, could you ever imagine committing such a sin? Can you imagine what would possess a person to, to do something like this? The younger priest said almost immediately, no, that, not a chance, never. Then the older one said, then you turn around and go back home. I'll carry on alone. The first moral of the story is that we probably need to empathize and be able to empathize more with others. And the second moral is, you are more than capable of doing any sin you have ever heard of. If you don't think so, then you're a bit naive, just like the young priest. Well, so let it be with our friend Doubting Thomas, Thomas the twin. Um, He's, he's, a, he's a doubter, and you too could doubt in the face of Christ's miracles and majesty. We know from the reading that he did doubt. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Well, it actually says not in your Bibles, but the Greek word here is au me, O-U-M-E. And that au me is actually a fascinating little bit of Greek. It is the most emphatic negative, like our never. And it's kind of a study in itself. It's, it's used five times in the Gospels by men, and three of those five times by the Apostle Peter. Who, um, who seems to uh, uh, be a little bit like me. He's, he's, he's more courageous and brave than he is intelligent. And so he goes off and does all these crazy things. Um, and of those five times that Aume is used in the New Testament, uh, it never, whatever they're, whatever they're saying never to, never comes true. Uh, on the other hand, it's used... Uh, 46 times by our Lord, and it is always made good. For example, in John 4:14, 4, uh, he says, um, uh, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never, that's the Aume, thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But who is this Thomas who was with Jesus from the beginning? Who is this man who would use such emphatic language to express his lack of faith? Until the Gospel of John, he just appears in lists of the apostles. Those are pretty good lists to appear in, uh, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but he doesn't have you know, the, 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 that, that much focus. So he just appears in, in, in Matthew 10 and Mark 3. He's just in a list of other apostles. But in Luke 6, we see more of Thomas's character. Jesus is now ready to go and to raise Lazarus. And Jesus is a wanted man. And traveling with him is pretty risky business. So Thomas speaks up and says, let us also go that we may die with him. So he's no coward and has seen the miracles performed by Jesus, miracles that would prove he was the Messiah. For Messiah would do 
all the healings that Scripture predicted. And, and so the Pharisees, and they, they could do some healings. Um, but Messiah would do three special healings, and that was heal a Jewish leper, and he did that in Luke 5. Exercise a mute demon, he did that in Mark 3. And heal a blind man since birth, and he did that in John 9. And Thomas had seen everything. And he had also been sent out and had performed miracles through the Holy Spirit himself. It was Thomas's question, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus then answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And that's in John 14. In the next chapter in John, um, he goes out uh, with Peter and Nathaniel and James and John and two others. And he's back to being one of many in a list. In Acts, we see Thomas for the last time and for the fourth time, he is again just in a list of apostles in the upper room. But <laughs> what a list. Uh, as the uh, Holy Spirit was at this time being poured out on them. We really don't know what happened uh, to Thomas. Uh, persistent legends suggest that he went to India, uh, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. These are in the south uh, of India. And indeed today, if you look at um, you know, where most Christians are in India, that is in the south, but then also this, this part of India that kind of goes out like an arm around Bangladesh. There you also have a lot of Christians. And you may say, well, yes, but I want evidence too, you know. Um, he asked for some pretty heavy evidence, and, and it's too bad that I don't get that evidence. Well, today we don't have that luxury of demanding what Thomas demanded. Um, but imagine that Donald Trump said this on television. Fellow Christians, listen to this. I have a vaccine for coronavirus that is being tested in Germany and shown to be safe and effective, but it is not yet approved by the Food and Drug Administration. There is a deliberate indifference to getting these sorts of miracle drugs out to those who need it most, but I, Donald J. Trump, will provide it free of cost. Do you know anyone who would sign up for that? I do. But if they were signing up for it and ready to take it, is it based on evidence? Is there any evidence there? So, you know, sometimes we hold the evidence for Christianity to amazingly high levels. Thomas did this, and we do it sometimes too. But for other things, even those things that have to do with our health and our safety. We just go with what sounds good. And here we come to the meat of this talk. We cannot see the risen Christ. We cannot put our fingers in his damaged hands or our hands in his open side. But we do have reliable historical claims. Now you say, wait a minute, just a minute. Claims, you might say? A claim isn't proof. How, how does a claim help? Well, um, claims might be more reliable than you think. So again, let's not hold the evidence too high. For example, some of our people in our congregation have said that they have been to Australia. But I've never seen Australia. I've never touched it. I've seen some maps and that kind of thing, but those can be faked. Who knows if Australia is really there? You would just have to trust the people that, that, that in our congregation that say, well, that's, yeah, I w it's there, I, I've been there. But how do they know they went there? You know, how do they know they didn't go someplace else in an airplane? And Australia doesn't really exist. And you say, well, that's silly, but in a way, that's, some of, that's how we react to some of the um, evidence that we have for Christ. Uh, when we get on an airplane, 
there's a claim by the airline that the pilots are competent and sober and will take us from where we are here, maybe out to Australia. But what evidence do we have for that? And imagine your child comes home from school and says, um, one of the little girls was pushed on the playground and, and she fell down and scraped her knee. Well, that's just a claim, but it's a pretty credible claim. And if you talk to the teacher later and the teacher said, well, yes, so you know, one of the kids got pushed down and so you know, we, we had to take care of her. And you think, well, you know, that, that, there are, those are two claims and that seems pretty reliable. So let's not you know, look for video evidence of, of Christ on the cross. So historical claims are strong uh, when they're supported by multiple independent sources. So we have that, we have multiple independent sources. Um, they're strong when they are, um, uh, when the facts uh, are uh, agreed to by um, uh, your enemies. Well, that's true. Uh, the details are embarrassing to the protagonist. So if we've written something that's embarrassing to sort of the heroes of the story, like the Gospels are, that's another very strong aspect of, of uh, historical claims. Um, and when these details are chronologically very close to the events themselves. So it seems we have all of that. So do we have proof? Do we have beveis of the most important parts of our faith? Well, I'll give you just five here. One, we have the claims of multiple eyewitnesses. You can see this easily in the slight variations of the Gospels um, and how the common stories uh, across the Gospels are related to us. There are no contradictions. There are just understandable and believable variations that lend credibility, that if you know, we saw uh, something, that one person would focus more on one part than another. The second one is we have first century non-Christian historians telling us of the life of Jesus, the events of the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the behavior of early Christians. We also have um, a dirty and embarrassing little story about the guards at the tomb and the hush money that they got. So here's a for number three, a little embarrassment there. There's more embarrassment. Um, uh, number four, we have the first century story of, well, profound embarrassment regarding the dedication of the women. The awe of the Gentile Roman guards and the bravery of the Jewish authorities. Think about Joseph of Arimathea and, and, and Nicodemus. And, and they're showing great courage and great bravery um, uh, uh, in, in, this, in this time. Contrast that with the cowardice of the apostles. Um, one would never write it that way uh, in the Gospels if it weren't true. And the last one is that all parties, Roman, Jewish, Christian, agree that the tomb was empty. They just have different explanations as to why. We see much of this recorded in um, 1 Corinthians, where Paul recounts what biblical scholars recognize as the earliest Christian creed from AD 33, possibly, um, with all the stuff that many skeptics say, oh, that came later, you know, his deity came later, and that he rose from the dead, that all came later. No, it came immediately after, afterward, and this is a great claim and very good um, evidence. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, um, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, in which you also stand, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. So you can ask them. Uh, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. 
So we had the gospel then as we have it today, consistent and right from the start. But Thomas was right not to be gullible. I mean, he was cowardly with all the other apostles, but it's right to not to be gullible. And, and you're right not to be gullible. Um, and this is the reason why John wrote his gospel. And it's at the last verse of, of, of our reading for today. Um, but these are written. All of these stories, all of these miracles are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, you and I are capable of great doubt and inattention and general nastiness. Um, Thomas's doubt shouldn't be strange to us, um, nor are our doubts and our questions strange. We need answers, and we do need faith, but only a mustard seed of faith. Nevertheless, if you want evidence, there is plenty of good evidence, solid evidence, and evidence that you have heard today, evidence that you can access in Scripture, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it will strengthen and shore up your faith. So let your faith grow so it can help you have a strong witness, help you be a good runner for Christ, and help you reap the blessings of faith without ever having seen or touched the risen Christ. Let me end with this short poem. It shows that the facts and evidence are not necessarily enough and that in the darkest moments, our faith is the thing that will sustain us. It's from Jeremiah Denton, uh, and he wrote this uh, while he was imprisoned as a, as, a, as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, an American uh, fighter pilot. Um, and as near as they could reckon, this was written about uh, Easter time, 1969, and it looks at the crucifixion through Mary's eyes. The soldiers stare, then drift away. Young John finds nothing he can say. The veil is rent, the deed is done, and Mary holds her only son. His limbs grow stiff, the night grows cold, but naught can loose that mother's hold. Her gentle, anguished eyes seem blind. Who knows what thoughts run through her mind? Perhaps she thinks of last week's palms with cheering thousands offering alms, or dreams of Cana on the day she nagged him till she got her way. Her face shows grief but not despair. Her head, though bowed, has faith to spare. For even now she could suppose his thorns might somehow yield a rose. Her life with him was full of signs that God writes straight with crooked lines. Dark clouds can hide the rising sun and all seem lost when all is one. And hallelujah, all has been one. Let us pray. Lord, we believe. Oh, help our unbelief. Father, you do right straight with the crooked lines of humanity. Help us to strengthen our faith, to engage more with your word, rest in the facts that surround your son's death and resurrection, and grow in sanctification as we understand the height and depth and length and width of your love for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.